A man shot in the back while running away, a cop on trial, and now it's a mistrial after one juror held out. We will discuss how difficult it is to convict an officer in a shooting. Then Donald Trump says that he will remove himself from the family business and leave the kids in charge. He wants to remove any possible conflicts of interest, he says, but the kids are also raising questions as well as concerns. And the president-elect, he is continuing to attack us, that would be the media, and he's also circumventing the media by tweeting out what he wants to say. Will that approach keep working once he moves into the Oval Office? Evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. We're going to start with the trial in South Carolina, where a mistrial has just been declared in the case against Michael Slager, the former North Charleston officer who shot a man named Walter Scott in the back. In the trial of former South Carolina police officer Michael Slager. We as a jury regret to inform the court that despite the best efforts of all members, we are unable to come to unanimous decision. The jury of 11 whites and one black deadlocked. The judge forced to declare a mistrial after jurors struggled to decide the fate of the North Carolina Charleston cop who shot and killed Walter Scott last year. Court, therefore, must declare a mistrial in this case. Scott, an unarmed black man, was running away after a traffic stop when video captured Officer Slager shooting Scott five times in the back. Somebody is running from you. You don't shoot them in the back. The incident is one of a string of police shootings of black men that has sparked protests across the country. An emotional Slager took the stand to say he felt threatened. He thought Scott had his taser. And at that point, I made a decision to use lethal force because Mr. Scott never stopped. He's always dangerous. Slager had trouble explaining why he picked up his taser from one location and moved it closer to Scott's body. Scott's family accused the officer of planning evidence. The circumstances, tough for jurors who have been deliberating for four days. He may have delayed justice, but he did not escape it. It's not over! So God say it's over. Let's introduce our panel. Richard St. Paul is an attorney. Jeannie Zeno, professor of political science at Iona College, also senior advisor at the consulting firm Applied Techonomics. And Andrew Whitman, our senior political correspondent, former Democratic New Jersey Congressman Steve Rothman, and Dominic Carter, political journalist and author. Um, I know I shouldn't be surprised, Richard, sometimes with these things, but in a million years with the video as clear as it was, running away, shot five times, and then the more you see of the video, uh, what looked very clear to be planted evidence. Um, I didn't think there'd be a juror alive that wouldn't have convicted. Apparently behind closed doors, in deliberations, one holdout juror said, maybe I could see manslaughter, I couldn't see murder. Um, and we have the mistrial today. Before we get to the fact that Oh, there'll be a retrial and everything else. What does this say? That even with this, there's not a conviction? Look, what it says is that it is very difficult to, co to convict a police officer in this country. According to a website, let's say, mapping, that's called uh, mappingpoliceviolence.com, says in 102 unarmed black men were killed in 2015. Of that 102, uh, only 10% uh, of that, about 10 police officers were charged with murder, and of that 10, uh, two were convicted. One served one year in jail. So that's about a 20% conviction rate, if you believe these stats. Now, why say if you believe these stats? That's because nationally... 2% actually, not 20. Yeah, go yeah ahead. correct. Yeah. Uh, it, but if, why say why you believe these stats is because nationally, these stats have not been kept. The FBI doesn't keep stats on... Uh, how many unarmed people, not just black people, how many unarmed people are killed by police officers. So these stats are very recent. If you look at a report uh, from the Huffington Post, it says that 74 police officers since 2005 have been charged with murder or manslaughter. Of that, about 30% have been convicted. Very few police officers are convicted of uh, murder or manslaughter when it, when it deals with their life or the thought of them being in fear for their life versus someone else, whether they're armed or unarmed. Okay. For me now, you're the attorney, and I should note here, Richard isn't some uh, lefty throwing whatever. You're not only uh, somebody who's served our country here, but uh, you're a member of the Republican Party and everything else. Yeah, you're civil certainly, rights attorney. Right. I, I prosecute police officers uh, so, civilly. So the point, though, is 
you don't usually have video where somebody's running and somebody shoots them in the back. Now, the Michael Brown case, I understood both sides of the argument. This one, to me, shocked me. And when I hear people say there's different sets of justice for if you're white, if you're black, I think 10 years ago in this country, more people would be a little bit like, ah, the more video that has come out has gotten people saying, what's going on here? And I know Dominic said, this has always been going on. You're just seeing this now, whether it's captured on a phone or whatever else. You agree with him? Look, the video, as, as an attorney, the video only is one part of the story. Always has been. No matter what video we see and, and our initial reaction, you know, that's terrible. And it really was terrible. I mean, to me personally, the guy is running away from you. He does not seem like a threat. If I was... You know, if I was back in the military, I would not shoot somebody who was running away in their back. I would probably be court-martialed if somebody found out that I did something like that. But when, he, when it comes down to a jury, a jury is human. And, they, and the police officer was obviously credible in, say, in believing that he feared for his life based upon a scuffle that took place where he says that uh, Mr. Scott tried to grab his taser and then ran away. But the, the words that the officer used was, I fired... Uh, until I, the threat was neutralized. And I said to myself, that doesn't add up. Somebody's running away ag from you. How is that a threat? Uh, how are they a threat? Uh, but the jury, in a lot of times, a lot of cases, gives the police officer the benefit of the doubt, as I demonstrated by the statistics before. I'll give you another statistic. In the past 20 years, for over the, the, there's been over about 13,000 cases that were referred to the Justice Department for prosecution under the federal civil rights law, which basically means you intentionally meant to kill somebody because, let's say, they were black or because of their color. Of those 13,000 plus cases, 96% of those cases were rejected by the Department of Justice because these cases are so hard to prove. Uh, I can get why people, Dominic, are angry uh, tonight here. Now, in this particular case, there's calm in South Carolina as we speak. You saw the family speak that they and the prosecutors, they're going to move for a retrial here. Um, and the belief is it's going to be very hard not to get a, a conviction given the uh, compelling evidence that is seen on really? video. Well, uh, <laughs> nobody thought that they weren't going to get a conviction today. I don't uh, know about that, Richard. I, I've been covering these cases for a very long time, and I, I, I hate to pull it in, put it in racial terms. I hate, I hate, but, but we have to be honest at some point. Counselor is giving you the diplomatic version. The truth is there's a reason why, and I don't want to sound polarizing, but it is what it is. There's a reason why 11 whites was on that jury. There's a reason for that, and only one black. There is a history in this country. Let's not act like, let's not, not be naive and act like, oh, we had a black president, so these things don't happen. Of course, the deck is stacked every day in courtrooms. Why do you think there wasn't more blacks on this jury? How does that represent a jury of the peers in the, in the community there in uh, South Carolina? The fact of the matter is, if a police, the code word, and the cops know, fear it for my life. That means if you're patrolling in the hood, Juries say they're patrolling in the hood. We give them the extra benefit of the doubt because they're in the zoo dealing with the animals. No conviction. Clearly, Period. though, here, by all accounts, there was one juror. Every other juror had agreed to convict him for murder, okay? So if we're doing the, the numbers here, 10 of the 11 whites wanted to convict this guy of murder, the officer. One didn't. Do you, one black. One black. I, I assume he was one of also who said, okay, do you ever wonder that maybe the bar is too high or that we have the best judicial system in the world, Congressman, but sometimes one lone wolf juror uh, can not only hang this thing here, but delay what seems to be uncontrivable inc evidence? You know, you, we all saw what we saw. And also when pressed as to why he threw the taser down from where it fell to where the body was, he didn't give an answer for it. I heard the courtroom testimony. It made no sense. But yet we are sitting again here where once again there's an inexplicable verdict. Well, as the grieving mother uh, of, this mur of this victim uh, said, there will be more opportunities to try this police officer. I wasn't on the jury, none of us here were, so we didn't hear all the testimony and we don't know well, why they made the decision. In the coming days, we'll hear from the jurors. They'll be speaking to the media, they're allowed to now, as to what was going through their minds. But the good news is that this matter will be tried again and there will be a verdict. There's been no verdict one way or the other now, it was a hung jury. But to see a video where an individual is running away, 
an unarmed individual, and then that individual is shot multiple times to his death is quite disturbing. Five times in the back. Um, I, I, yeah, Andrew, I go just ahead. want to ask Richard a legal question, because several times in the point of this conversation, it's been if the officer feared for his life, mm -hmm. and we've used that as, as a bar. Is that the bar that an officer has to clear? If, if an officer fears for his life, is any, is any action justifiable? Yes, then deadly force is so, so maybe that's the root of the problem. I mean, there are a number of roots to this problem, and I'm not you know, naive enough to think that I know the answer to them all. But we have a jury system of challenges that led to the jury that they got, whether that's right or wrong. If the threshold, though, for a cop's action be, I mean, it, it sounds like that's an incredibly low bar for an officer to clear. All they have to do, you can't get in somebody's head. All they have to do is say, I feared for my life. And if that's the case, I'm assuming that every cop fears for his life when there's a, a deadly shooting. A absolutely. A absolutely. That is, that is the standard. And look, when I'm... Uh, acting as a, uh, a, an attorney suing police departments, including here in Westchester in New York City, uh, there is something called an escalation of force. Start, starting with a verbal command to follow the police officer, stop, put your hands up, up to taser, up to the baton, and then uh, deadly force. There is nothing in the patrol guide that they use that says when you have to use deadly force, or you can only use it in these instances. It, th there you have a lot of discretion upon where you should use deadly force. And police officers look at, I, I want to go home to my family too, mm -hmm. I have to protect myself. So there's a lot of discretion. But, if, but, if but better training can help If the threshold was actually in, the, like their life was actually in jeopardy as opposed to they felt their life was in jeopardy. I don't know if that's too imbalanced against police, but that seems like it would be a difference with a distinction. You know, Jeannie, it it's, it's runs a gamut. I, I had people this week and say, how did they not convict him? You know, they always figure if you're sitting on a TV set, somehow you know. And I'm like, I, I don't know. They were at that point going to deliberate, and they did. They picked it up today. But they said, how did Officer Liang, in a dark stairwell, right, unintentionally shoot, but nonetheless kill a poor Kai Gurley, right? And he gets convicted, and this guy walks, albeit temporarily, or we'll see, okay? But to me, there's another argument. The police departments, I know there's cops watching uh, this show a, a lot. And I'm sure some of them are saying, oh, there goes Rich, you know, uh, trying to, you know, blame every cop for everything. To me, no. I think I remember Dallas. I remember doing these horrible stories. And we've had more officers die in the line of duty this year than in recent memory. And it's horrible. And I wouldn't want to do some of the jobs and some of the patrols they do. But when there is any form of coverage, and to be fair, in South Carolina, they fired this cop. Uh, as soon as the shooting happened. But they when there's ever any them. blue wall that protects these guys, that sends out the message that somehow this guy might have done a bad shoot, but he's one of ours. Again, in South Carolina, I don't think this happened here, but we've seen that time and again. And that's, I think, part of the problem where we have the us and them in so many communities. I mean, after living through the election we just lived through, when Donald Trump and Steve Bannon and everybody else in this election used race in order to really divide the country, in an enormously, uh, it was so in your face, much more, I, I think, than the Southern strategy that Ronald Reagan used. And the idea that on this case you could find one, I'm surprised that it was only one of 12, by the way, who just held out, one of 12 held out. I thought there would be more. We're living in an incredibly divided country. It's incredibly racially divided. And this election has shown that is the case and that strategy is working. Mm. So it is very tough for you to get up and convict these officers. And I'm not saying I was there or I know the exact extent of what happened, but you look at that video and anybody looks at that, there is no way that he was doing this because he felt threatened by this man running and away. we saw his immediate uh, aftermath. I gotta unfortunately hit a break, but Richard, as always my friend, it's good seeing always you. A pleasure. I hope that we'll continue to talk about this case in the future because we believe there will be a retrial, but we'll keep you updated on it. Now, the rest of the panel will stay with us, and we'll pivot to politics. As, Jean as Jeannie mentioned, this, these kind of things don't happen in a vacuum. We're going to talk to an ethics expert on the possible conflicts of interest from President Trump. He says there's nothing to worry about that the president-elect, but my guest says not so fast.